If you have a Bible, turn with me to uh, Job 19. This is week 10 of our study through the book of Job called If God is Good. And if you're new with us, what we tend to do is uh, we're, we're about 90% of the time we're in a particular book of the Bible, so working our way uh, through it. Again, this is our 10th week in the book of Job, and it's a, it's a practice called expositional preaching, and it goes all the way back to Jesus and the apostles, actually. To exposit just means to explain the text in its context. We believe that uh, when we go to the Bible, when we read the Bible, we actually get to hear from God. And what God has to say is, is far more important than what anybody else has to say, because He alone is God. And when we do open the Bible, we want, to, we want to approach it responsibly, and we want to interpret it accurately, and again, lean in and listen to what God would have us hear and learn and do. Uh, by the time we get to Job 19, which is where we are this morning, you know, as you know, Job has lost everything. This happened in the first couple of chapters. Uh, he's lost his wealth. He's lost um, his, his livelihood. He's lost his own children, and he's in this incredible state of devastation, And three of his friends come to him, and they actually come to him with the answers. They they have the answer as to why Job is suffering. They can actually answer the why question. But they all pretty much say the same thing, using different words. They say, look, this is the way the world works. Bad people get bad things from God. Good people get good things from God. And the fact that you've gotten so many bad things must mean that you're necessarily a bad person. So why don't you just give it up? Repent. Confess your secret sin. Just lay it out there before the Lord, and then things will go well with you. Um, Again, by the time we get to chapter 19, actually all three of Job's friends have come to Job once. Two of Job's friends have actually come to him a second time. And his third friend, uh, Zophar, will approach Job in the coming chapters, but we're going to look at Job's response to uh, one of his friends this morning. And, you know, we've already seen in this, in this book, and we've seen in the New Testament as we've referenced it, that that's, that's actually not how God works, the way his friends say. Uh, this is not how God works at all. Uh, and at this point, Job's had enough of his friends' painful advice. He actually refers to in this chapter as violence. Uh, but in this chapter, we actually get the first glimpse of hope from Job. So you've seen the desperation, and you've seen you know, all the, the angst and the pain, and this morning we'll see just a glimmer of hope. The passage kind of breaks down into three parts, um, a dangerous weapon, a, a broken picture, and a reason for hope. Now, it, seems, it all seems kind of random when I say it that way, but I think it's gonna, it'll all make sense as we move along. So uh, we're going to cover chapter 19 this morning. Let me begin by reading verses 1 through 6. Here reads the word of the Lord. Then Job answered and said, How long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? These ten times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? And even if it be true that I have erred, my error remains with myself. If indeed you magnify yourselves against me and make my disgrace an argument against me, Know then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net about me. Now, I want to pause there because there's something very practical and something very important that I don't want to gloss over. Um, With all the stuff that Job has been through, and we've talked about it through the past few weeks, with all the stuff that Job has been through, incredibly, he actually complains more about his friend's bad counsel than his actual circumstances. So he has more words, he uses more words to complain about what his friends say to him than he does to actually characterize his situation. Uh, He does this in chapter 4, 8, 9, 11, 12, 15, 16, and then here in 19. He says in verse 2, How long will you torment me and break me into pieces with your words? Now the the Hebrew word translated you is actually in plural, and so he's talking to all of his friends, and he, he's saying to them, your words have crushed me. Your words have inflicted incredible anguish on me. Your words have brought about more pain, he says, in essence, than the physical pain I've experienced. 
Verse 3, Job says, these ten times you have cast reproach on me. Now, ten is not to be taken literally. It's, it's, a, it's a designation that just means a lot of times. It's kind of like in, in Genesis 31, you may recall Jacob is working for his father-in-law Laban. And all of a sudden, because of some things that are said about Jacob, uh, Laban starts to treat Jacob poorly. And then, then Jacob goes to him, he says, ten times you've changed my wage. Like, what are you doing here? Well, what Job is saying is over and over and over and over again, you've brought these bogus charges against me. You brought shame to my name. Job's friends have brought him to a new, and I think we can say unparalleled, devastating low. So what are we to learn from this? Well, I think it's really the power of words. Here's our first point this morning. Our words carry unrivaled potential to heal or destroy. You know, there are times when, when our words actually cause way more pain than something we could do, even a physical action. And I think, though, in an age where sarcasm reigns, insincerity is a cherished virtue, and virtually every sitcom sort of traffics in, you know, put down after put down for laughs, it's easy to forget just how much damage we can do with our words. Everything we say serves either, either to tear down or to build up the object of our speech. The Proverbs even go so far as to say life and death are in the power of the tongue. My sister, is a, she works in a hospital ER. She's a social worker. And her job, I mean, imagine this. Her job is to be the one to tell the families when the one they've been praying for and hoping for and longing for their recovery has actually passed away. So she's the one who has to go and sit the family down and say, you know, I'm so sorry to have to tell you this. Well, I, I asked my sister one time, I said, how, how do, like, what's the typical response? And she says, well, of course, there's no, there's no typical response, but she said, um, it's all, the response is almost always visceral. In other words, she said, sometimes before I can even get the words out of my mouth, People are collapsed on the floor or screaming or, or wailing. And my sister knows just by saying a few words that this will send people into this in, incredible tailspin. Our, wor our words have so much power. Our words can kill. The tongue can cause the death of marriages, churches, families, friendships, dreams, careers, reputations. And here's the thing, our words are almost never neutral. They're almost never neutral. You know, even if we say a joke, even if it's a clever, there's almost always something behind our words. I know if a guy comes up to me and says, did you forget to tuck your shirt in today? What he's really saying is, I think you look sloppy with your shirt untucked. You know, the, the, the most likely, sometimes. I know if some, someone says to me, oh, that was a great sermon. I really understood that one. <laughs> what he's really saying to me is, I, I don't understand you half the time. But that time I did. I know if someone says to me, as this uh, guy did, we were having uh, dinner with a new couple. This is a little while ago. But this guy looked at me, and this is a true story, looked at me and then looked at Janine and said, how did you get her? And I know what he was saying. He was saying, there's a marked disparity between your physical appearance and her physical appearance. And I said, like, I, I don't know, but, but I'll, I'll tell you this, I would rather have it this way than the opposite. I mean, who wants to think they're way better looking than their wife? So, I mean, you know, people, we, we say things to each other, and our words are rarely neutral, and our words do leave an impact. We can provide healing, or we can destroy we almost always do one or the, or the other. And the, the fact is, we're, we're, we're never sinless with our words. We cannot control our tongues. Jesus' brother James says this. No one can control his tongue. If anyone could, he would be faultless and perfect, able to keep his whole body in check. You know, sometimes we, we read scriptures that talk about all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we know that. I mean, we know that we've sinned, but, you know, we think, well... I mean, I don't know. I mean, not really like some people have, or not really like I've seen other people do. And we, we're quick to 
equivocate and justify and rationalize and stuff. And, and sometimes our actions, you know, we can actually successfully rationalize them. But if we ever get to the point where, you know, we do believe, and I know some people may believe this because some people just have almost an impossible time saying I was wrong. But if we ever get to the point where we start to believe, you know, maybe I'm not so bad, it's our tongue that reveals really our depravity, the selfishness, the mean-spirited comments, the impatient words, the subtle jabs, those we cannot deny. We can, we can justify them, but we cannot deny them. New Testament scholar Daniel Doriani says, the tongue daily demonstrates both our sinfulness and our inability to reform ourselves. The Proverbs say, when words are many, sin is not absent. If we open our mouths, we will sin. In fact, the failures of the tongue are often used in Scripture as a way to actually demonstrate tangibly the fallenness of humanity. So our words can heal or they can hurt, and they certainly do reveal our sinfulness. Well, Job's friends' words have crushed him. Now, one more thing to point out in this first section that's important. Verse 4, Job says, And even if it be true that I have erred, my error remains with myself. So Job's not saying, look, okay, you know what? You're right. You're right. I, I, I have had this secret sin that I've kept hidden, and I'm, not, I'm finally going to tell you what it is. He's not saying that he has uh, this, some secret sin when he says, even if it be true. Nor is he saying that it's wrong for friends to confront one another when there's clear sin. Actually, this is a responsibility of believers, those within the believing community, to confront one another when a person is caught in sin. But that's not what Job's saying. What Job is complaining about is the fact that his friends have made these assumptions about him, that God is doing something because Job has secretly sinned, and he's saying, look, if that were the case, I'm already suffering enough. Why do you have to pile on with your bad counsel? Now, look at verses 6 through 13. Know then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net about me. Behold, I cry out violence, but I'm not answered. I call for help, but there's no justice. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness about upon my paths. He has stripped from me my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I'm gone. And my hope he has pulled up like a tree. He has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together. They have cast up their siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. He has put my brothers far from me and those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. So even though Job complains that his friend's words have nearly destroyed him. Job knows that ultimately he's suffering according to God's sovereign plan. I mean, he, he gets that. In fact, uh, nine times in just six verses we read, he has done these things, talking about God. Verse 6, God has put me in the wrong. Verse 8, he has walled up my way. Verse 9, he has stripped me of my glory. Verse 10, he breaks me down on every side. Verse 11, he has kindled his wrath. Verse 12, he has put my brothers far from me. So, so Job doesn't understand it, and he doesn't know why that, you know, by his estimation, God has hunted him down and, and tormenting him. But he does know that somehow, some way, in a way that he can't fully fathom, this is all part of God's sovereign design. God's the one behind this. Now, previously, Job has confessed God's blessing on him. And previously, Job was treated as a king, right? I mean, he's, he's the most respected man. He's wealthy. He's prominent. He has a large family, which was a great sign of success in terms of the ancient Near Eastern world. So he has been regarded as a king. And now he says God has removed that glory and brought him to shame. Again, and yet all of this, Job knows that both the good and the bad ultimately come from the hand of the Lord. It reminds us of what Job said on the day when all this, uh, this tragedy struck with messenger after messenger coming to Job. You've lost your livestock. You've lost your cattle. You've lost your oxen. You've, you've lost your wealth. You've lost your children. Job says, 
in that he says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job knows that the good things he has and the good he's experienced is from the hand of God. And he also knows that the bad he's experienced somehow is part of God's providence. And the point I made during our first chapter the first week was that everything we have and experience is from the hand of God, evidence of his mysterious and divine providence. And what that means for us this morning, if you're a Christian, what you're going through right now, or what you've been through, or what you will go through, it's all part of God's providential plan for your good and his glory. Doesn't mean it's going to make sense to you anytime soon. It doesn't mean that you're going to get the answer to the why question, at least in terms of the micro reason. It doesn't mean that you'll even be able to imagine what good could possibly come from it. But even so, you can be sure that what you're going through is the hand of a loving fa- at the hand of a loving father, and it is for your ultimate benefit. I mean, Job is, you, you can sense the consternation. Job is wrestling He is wrestling. He can't make sense of it, but he knows that God's behind it. Now look at verses 13 through 22. He's put my brothers far from me, and those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I've become a foreigner in their eyes. I call to my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with him in my mouth for mercy. My breath is strange to my wife, and I am a stench to the children of my own mother. Even the young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I love have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. O you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? So, one of the most intense pains that Job is actually suffering is the separation that he feels from the people that he loves. His friends believe that Job is secretly a wicked man and that God is punishing him because of it. And so, they've, they've actually, they don't want to be around Job. They're afraid to be around Job because they don't want to be considered guilty by association. So they've kept their distance. They have totally turned their back on Job. Even more, Job says, they despise him. Job's relatives, verse 14, have failed him. His closest friends have forgotten him. His servants will not respond. Even Job's wife, he says, is repulsed by Job's breath, which doesn't mean that necessarily she thinks his breath stinks. It's a, it's a metaphor of saying she won't get anywhere close to him. You ever been close to someone who has really bad breath? Like you try to figure out, how can I escape this situation? Job's wife is saying, I don't even want to be near my, own, my, my husband. Job's own siblings, the children of my mother, he says, abhor Job. So Job has never felt so alone, so rejected, One commentator says, this particular speech reveals more about Job's heart than any other. He writes, Job's burning concern for God does not make him insensitive to human relationships. On the contrary, the two are inseparable in the life of any person who attains wholeness as a human being. So here's why this is so profound, I think, and so interesting. To Job, his rejection by God is experienced most acutely by the rejection he suffers from his friends and his family. The two go hand in hand. So here's our second point. The loving acceptance that we experience from our friends is meant to give us a taste. Now, certainly it's an impartial taste of what God's loving acceptance feels like. It's pretty striking, as I mentioned earlier, that Job actually spends more time bemoaning his friend's rejection of him than he does about his specific circumstances. And think about everything he's been through. 
we've talked about it every week. I mean, when you put all of it, you consider all of it at once, it's just, it's unimaginable. And yet Job spends, he uses more words, so to speak, to complain about his friend's painful counsel than he does all that he's experienced. His friends, uh, again, they've rejected him. They're now ashamed to be anywhere near him. I know some of you really like country music. Like, I don't get it myself, but um, I know some of you really, really love it. And, you know, when uh, Luke Bryan comes to town, you know, it's like the Pope at a Catholic parade. I mean, you just, it, you're out there for it, and, and that's cool. But um, I don't know, I was in Cracker Barrel the other day, actually in the men's room, right, and, and, and the country music was blaring. I thought, how do people do this? I don't know, I, don't, I mean, it was just so corny. Um, but... You know, I mean, I like, I like just about every genre of music except country, but I, I actually like, and you can mock me for this, but I really like blues music. I've, I've always liked blues music. I like Robert Johnson and Etta James and John Lee Hooker. And in the 80s, I had this strange infatuation with the Robert Cray band. It was really unhealthy, but I, I, I like blues music. Well, here's the thing about, thing about blue, blues music. The theme of just about 50% of blues songs is about being deserted by a loved one or a friend. I mean, half the songs are actually about this. Um, Eric Clapton's The Lonely Stranger. Um, Jimmy Cox's Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out. John Lee Hooker's Don't Look Back. I mean, you know, we could go on and on. You get the idea. That's kind of understood to be as low as a person can go. When, when your friends, your closest friends, and your family, when they turn their back on you, that's regarded about as, as low as a person can go. And it's not terribly surprising if we think theologically for a minute. As human beings, we're created for relationship. Remember, uh, when God created mankind, He said, let us make man in our image. He didn't say that about the plants, the planets, the stars, the tree. He said, let us make man in our image. Who's us? Nobody else around but God. Well, He's talking about the triune God. Forever exists as Father, Son, and Spirit. God is by nature relational, we might say. And we as His creatures, those made in His image, we also are relational beings. So we're made for relationship, both the vertical relationship with our Creator, but also the horizontal relationship with others who bear God's image. And the horizontal relationships that we experience are meant to actually give us a category for or as I said before, a taste of what that vertical relationship with God is like. So when I officiate a wedding, and I don't know, I've done dozens over the years, I, I try to tailor the sermon, you know, for, for that individual couple, you know, which naturally, right? So I want to include some things about the husband-to-be and some things about the bride-to-be, and it's always better if I actually know them well, but I try to make sure that it's tailored and personalized for the actual individual couple and so that makes every, you know, every marriage ceremony unique and special, as it should be. Uh, but there's one thing that I include without fail in every marriage ceremony that I ever do, and that is I want the couple to know that, that marriage was designed by God for both a horizontal and a vertical reason. There's a, both dimensions to it. So horizontally, we might say, God designed marriage so that you, as you're about ready to get married, you will enjoy intimacy and oneness and laughter and a depth of friendship and closeness that you won't experience probably otherwise. So there's that dimension. But I also want them to know that there's a vertical dimension. And Paul says, makes this very point in Ephesians 5, that the way that a husband loves his wife and the way that a wife responds to her husband is actually meant to give the watching world a category for the way God loves his own people. So when people see a marriage, they're able to get just a glimpse of what sacrificial love looks. Now, of course, it's imperfect, you know, but it's a glimpse. And this, exp this extends beyond marriage, too, of course. When fathers love their children well, they showcase to them the love of God. You see a beaming father, so proud of his son. You get a glimpse, an imperfect glimpse, but a glimpse of God's love 
for his own children. When friends forgive one another, they model the forgiveness of God. When brothers and sisters in Christ sacrifice for one another, they point to the sacrifice of God in Christ. When we are deeply and unconditionally loved by a friend, we experience on some level what God's love is like. All those give us a glimpse into God's love, God's acceptance and what that's like. And I believe this is why, at least one reason, there are many reasons probably, but this is at least one reason why Job's rejection by his friends and his wife feels so utterly devastating. Because it's actually distorting his view of God. Now, I think just by way of application, you know, I know that's deep theological discussion, but by way of application, a couple things. One, if you're not enjoying authentic, meaningful, real sort of friendships with other believers where you can take your mask off and be yourself, then you're not really, you, you have a hampered view of what God is like. And so, pursue someone. Find a place to belong. Get involved in a small group. Go after someone relationally. And if, you're, if you feel like you're not being pursued, be the one to take the initiative to reach out. And a second application, which is really more of a question, I guess, and that is, what are we revealing about God to the people closest to us? What are they discerning about God in the way that we love them, in the way that we care for them, in the way that we serve them, in the way that we sacrifice for them, in the way that we forgive them? What are we communicating? Now, it wasn't just for the, the restoration of his friendships that Job uh, longed for. Look at verses 23 and 24. He says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. Now, uh, some of you have asked me, uh, several of you have asked me, well, who, who, wrote, who wrote the book of Job? In other words, how do we have this very specific dialogue? I think it's a terrific question. And, you know, I mentioned in our first week of this study that the events of Job probably happened sometime after Noah, so sometime after Noah, um, but likely during the early patriarchal period, so, you know, with the, with the patriarchs, and yet they weren't likely recorded, codified, written down until sometime around the days of Solomon, which, of course, begs the question, who knew about all this stuff? And who would have possibly known this dialogue? And I think the answer is either Job passed the, all of this down sort of orally, and it was later written down, or the Holy Spirit revealed in great detail to, an, we're not told who wrote it, to an unknown author, could have been Moses, could have been Solomon, uh, could have been Elihu, it could have been somebody else, precisely what happened and what was said. So we don't know exactly, but we know the Holy Spirit uh, has, you know, revealed in great detail with precision what happened. So Job says, look, if my words were written down, all people forever would marvel at my misery. And then he makes one of the most famous statements in the book. Look at verses 25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed... Yet in my flesh I shall see God. Whom shall I see for myself? And my eyes shall behold and not another. My heart faints within me. So we read that and we say, finally, a glimmer of hope. Finally, a little bit of positivity from Job. He says, I know my Redeemer lives. Now, who's he talking about? Well, verse 26 makes it clear. He's talking about God. He's talking about God. Job is rejoicing in God, which sounds a little bit schizophrenic, doesn't it? What I mean by that, in one breath, Job says, God has put all of this on me. God has brought me low. He has made me to be a shame for all people to see. He's hunted me down and imprisoned me. And then the next, next breath, he says, but oh, that God would rescue me. Oh, that God would come to my aid. Old Testament scholar John Hartley writes, Job is beseeching the God in whom he has faith to help him against the God who is punishing him. Now, we've seen this book, this whole thing really play out 
you know, a bit like a courtroom. I mentioned that a few times. And it's almost as though Job wants God to save him from God. Now, what Job doesn't realize is, in a sense, he is grasping at the seed level the beauty of the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God delivers his own people from God himself. From his own wrath, so to speak. Because the living God is holy, every person must give an account for their rebellion against him. Every person must answer for every hidden thought, every secret lustful glance, every uh, spiteful or impatient word, every action, every motive. We all will give an account. I will give an account for all of those things. And so will you. And if my defense is, I didn't know any better, or I tried to obey, or I did my very best, or as I've heard so many times, my good outweighed my bad. If our defense is any one of those things, or anything like those things, we will be left guilty and condemned by God the object of his eternal wrath, which is a terrifying thing, isn't it? But God, seeing that we are helpless and need of a Savior, sent his own Son, God in the flesh, the second member of the Trinity, to live for us and to die for us as our substitute and to be raised again as an affirmation that his atoning work was sufficient. Now, to be clear... Job is not thinking about Jesus here. He's not thinking about Jesus when he says, my hope is in my Redeemer. He didn't know that Jesus Christ, by his death and resurrection, would satisfy the full wrath of God against sinners. But Job was trusting that the same God who permitted such painful injustices would also ultimately make things right, including Job's relationship with his Creator by sending someone Job didn't know all the details by sending someone who would be a mediator. Job believed that one day in his flesh, he would see God. And that's profound, isn't it? I mean, not floating around as a spirit, not in some sort of ethereal existence, but with real eyes, he would be in the real presence of God. And Job believed that that same God would restore everything that was lost that would silence his enemies and would avenge all those who had wronged Job. Job didn't know that Jesus would suffer the way that he would, all the way to death, even though he was innocent, so that we could receive forgiveness. But Job knew that somehow, some way, by a person that God would send, that God would make things right. Now, what we know, that Job didn't, is the how and the extent of God's redemptive work. So not only will God repay everyone who's harmed us, not only will God restore everything that's broken with this sin-cursed world, not only will God in the future make everything right, but God's redemptive work has already begun in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So Job knows something, but to us on the other side of the cross, this mystery has been revealed. Here's our final point. In Christ, God has brought about forgiveness and reconciliation right now for those who believe in the one He sent. And what that means is if you are in Christ, you are already reconciled to God. Yes, the future holds something so marvelous and so incredible that we can't even get our minds around it. But right now, at this moment, you are right with God. He's not holding your sins against you. You are actually His delight. When you stand before God at the end of your life, it will be Jesus' perfect record of obedience that God judges you on. Yes, one day you will see Him. Praise God for that. And it's not going to be some 
floating around ethereal existence, but with real human glorified bodies on a real earth that's been refurnished by fire will be with, with God in God's presence. That's in the future. But even today, right now, He is your beloved Father and you are His beloved child. For all those ways that we sin and all the ways that we use our tongue for evil, all the things that I say that I just immediately after, want to, I just want to get that back. All the ways that we sin even the harsh and selfish ways that we use our tongues, we have been totally and completely forgiven. If you are in Christ this morning, you are completely and totally forgiven by God. And not only are the benefits of Christ's work, past work applied to us, but even today at this very moment, Jesus is with us reassuring us of the Father's love, speaking hope into our hearts, affirming to us the Father's forgiveness, and waking us up every morning with new mercies. Job didn't understand all of it, but he knew that God would deliver him from God, that a holy God who will require an accounting from every person was gracious and merciful enough to send His own Son out of love, the God-man, God in the flesh, who would live for us, die for us, be raised again for us, and even now intercedes for us. This is all true for those who are in Christ. If you're not in Christ this morning, if you're relying on your own good works, your own obedience, your own record, your own family lineage, or maybe you're not even relying on anything, maybe you're running from God. You, you, you believe God is in, in the rearview mirror and you're just trying to stay away from Him. If you're apart from Christ this morning, if you've never repented of your sin, trusted in Jesus Christ, you're not right with God. But even today, God offers a chance, an opportunity to repent and believe. And I pray that if that's the case for you, that today would be the day of salvation. Let's pray.